My name's Amy McDonald. I'm the director of this joint. You are in for a real treat tonight hearing two of the smartest people in public radio. Deep, uh, <laughs> deep in conversation. You, Steve Inskeep, host of NPR's Morning Edition and our own Meghna Chakrabarty, host of On Point. The last time Meghna and Stephen graced the stage was February 2020. So it struck me then, Steve, when I read the dedication to your book, to your wife and daughters, to Carolee, Ava, Anna, and Molly, who saw this book finished the final year we all lived under one roof. So this is your COVID book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Steve will be signing copies of Differ We Must. It's a terrific book, by the way. It's, it's, it's a page turner in our lobby after the conversation. Thank you to Brookline Booksmith, our partner. We will be taking your questions throughout the hour. Just go to slido.com and type in hashtag Inskeep. Take it away, Megna. Thank you. Uh, Steve, it's a pleasure to see you again, first Thank and you. foremost. Thank you. Glad uh, to see you, too. But before we start, I would like to uh, have you all commit the following set of digits to memory, okay? 1-800-909-9287. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. You have 24 more hours <laughs> to dial that number, please. Or, you know wbur.org on your phone. Uh, I just came downstairs from saying that number about a million times upstairs in one of the studios. So I thought one more chance with you folks. But thank you so much for coming tonight to hear Steve talk about his new book. As, as you're talking, I'm just remembering when I worked at uh, WBGO, the public radio station in Newark, New Jersey, and one morning we were saying the number again and again and getting no phone calls. And I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes later, we realized the phone bank had been unplugged. No. <laughs> like the, so kind of cut down on the contributions. But anyway, <laughs> thanks to those who. It's always something in yeah, fundraising. Yeah, it's true. Uh, okay, so Steve, my first question is, I can imagine that you were thinking to yourself, I mean, the title of your book is... Um, uh, divided, we we must. Differ, we must. Differ, we must. Sorry, excuse me. So that you're thinking. We actually said beforehand we could do a drinking game every time we say differ. <laughs> so that's one. Go on. Unfortunately, all we have up here is water. Yeah, though, but, too um, bad. Uh, so I just want to learn more about why you chose the person you chose because you're thinking to yourself, I want to write this book about how leadership operates in times of great difference or division and how leaders effectively talk to people across beliefs and differences. And maybe I'll pick someone that hasn't been studied very much. <laughs> and you came and you're like, Abraham Lincoln, there you he's go. the one. There you go. Well, I wish that I was that systematic about what my <laughs> objective was. Um, I do my uh, research, in fact, my journalism often by thrashing around in the dark trying to figure out what my topic is. Um, in this case, it's a very obvious topic, a huge American historical figure who's been written about 18,000 times, 18,000 books, according to the uh, head of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library who interviewed me on stage the other night. That's a lot. So what can you possibly add to that? Uh, and I hesitated even to start, even though I've been drawn to Lincoln ever since I was a kid growing up in Indiana, where he spent most of his early years. Um, and I had to do two other books on the 19th century before I had the confidence <laughs> to think I might have anything possibly to add to what uh, other people have already written about Lincoln. Um, and then I got the concept to try to tell his life story through a series of meetings that he had with other people. Uh, the thing that got me going about that was an encounter when he was a young man extremely poor, living on his own for the first time in a village called New Salem, Illinois, near what was then the frontier uh, of the westward expanding United States. And a group of bullies accosted him. And the head of the group, a guy with the improbable name of Jack Armstrong, um, challenged him to a wrestling match. And there are varying accounts of this wrestling match and the results of it, but Lincoln did well enough to earn the respect of the bullies who eventually became his political supporters and friends mm. and voted for him even though they were in the other party. 
Um, and I thought, wow, I could tell this guy's whole life story through meetings like that. I went through the book, and the chapter I just conceived to you is not in the book. <laughs> um, I cut it out to make the book shorter. But I did discover these other meetings, and I had an idea that I could kind of show the diversity of America through meetings with different people who were men and women, as well as different races and different backgrounds, different classes. And then I realized it wasn't just diversity that I wanted to talk about. It was disagreement mm -hmm. and how to deal with that. Um, I, and that's, I guess, what I mean by thrashing around in the dark. I kind of evolved toward the topic because of the news I was covering at the same time. And the topic on the past and the news I was covering in the present, I think, began to converge in that way. And I realized what this material that I was thrashing around in for several years had to say to me and I hope had to say to us in the present. Yeah. Uh, where do you find the time to do this again? I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, I get obsessed with, uh, with writing and... Uh, it's fueled also by my coverage of the news. Things happen that remind me of the past, and also my research will uh, spur me forward into journalism. But I'll be writing on like a Saturday morning. I'll be writing in the evening when I really ought to go to bed uh, because I have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to do the show. Most days, not every day, but most days. Um, I will be writing at midday. I will be writing when I have a down hour. Um, I will be... Maybe you have the same experience. I'll be driving my kids somewhere and I'm kind of thinking through things. Or, uh, I mean, my kids are getting a little older now, but supervising someone very small in a playground, which is a little <laughs> mindless, you know? Yeah. And there's a fence around the playground. The kid's not going to go too far. And so you're just there like thinking, you know, or even researching uh, on your phone. Um, and it just kind of, I, that, that is also a matter of thrashing around. Yeah. I might do a different book in a different way if I was like Robert Caro, the great uh, writer of, uh, biographer of Lyndon Johnson and of Robert Moses, who may spend 10 or 12 or 15 years yeah. researching. And then when he's pretty sure he's got the story, he gets the piece of paper to put in his typewriter, which he still uses, and writes the, the book, the first draft of the book. I thrash around. I start writing something, and then I realize I don't know enough yet, so I go back and do some research and go back again and write some more. Amazing. That's amazing. Um, about playgrounds, I have a tree climber in my family, so oh. I do space out a little bit and just c cross my fingers that I don't hear a child falling out of a tree. Um, if you space out <laughs> while standing, like, <laughs> that might work. Um, I want to talk about a few of the people in the book in just a second, okay. but you caught my attention with... Uh, what you said about being a young boy and mm -hmm. being enamored of Abraham Lincoln, even as a young boy. So what did young Steve Inskeep see in Lincoln that ca so captured your attention? First, there are the Lincoln Logs. <laughs> <laughs> did anybody here play with Lincoln Logs? Yeah, yeah, I have a lot of hands go up. That's really great. Um, I played with Lincoln Logs when I was a kid. And then this amazing thing happens where you realize, like, he's also on the penny. Um, <laughs> And then just like, $5 bill, holy cow. Um, and then you are, to be perfectly honest, at least where I grew up, and maybe in most of the United States, you're fed a certain amount of Lincoln propaganda. Yeah. He's around all the time. He's a heroic figure. You learn about him in elementary school. I have a kind of vague memory of film strips. Like, I mean, that, I guess that dates me, right? That I actually had film strips in school, but there were film strips about his youth. And there are particularly stories about his youth, which is supposed to be inspiring to young people like I was at the time, that he was uh, born, you can say born into poverty. I think for his time where most people were in poverty, it was just an ordinary existence, but it was a frontier existence. When he was about seven years old, his father lost the family farm through a property title dispute. In fact, his father lost the farm three times um, and ended up abandoning Kentucky where the property rules were just not very favorable and moved to southern Indiana, which was effectively new territory, a brand new state that had been mostly wrested from the Indians for which Indiana was named um, and uh, brought onto a piece of land. And his father, he's seven his father hands him an ax and says, it's time for you to help me clear the trees off of this farm. And for the next roughly 15, 16 years of his life, he's working manual labor, using that ax an enormous amount, 
hardly ever going to school. He later estimated that he spent less than a year in school, well, uh, less than a year formal education, and effectively taught himself to read, borrowed books from lots of people. Um, uh, then there are legendary stories, you know, about walking for miles to borrow a book and damaging somebody's book and having to work off the damage to the book, like do some labor. But what turned out to be more relevant to me, and that I, something that I did not learn to realize until I did the research for this book, was not um, his reading, which was not that wide or deep. I mean, there was not the kind of like library that you would find at Harvard or something in Southern Indiana. I mean, he would just read whatever came across his path. Uh, I mean, like me growing up in Indiana reading Reader's Digest or something. Um, but he had people around him mm. and he studied people, which proved to be a fantastic education for a democratic, small d democratic leader, because while not every book is a good book, Every person is a relevant and valuable person in a democracy because that person may grow up to have a vote. Um, and there are accounts, uh, particularly by his stepmother, of his observation in, of people even when he was a child. Grown-ups would come to the house and talk with his parents and he would sit there listening and then ask a million questions after they left about what was going on. So I have always had Lincoln in my head in answer to your question. And the Lincoln in my head, I think, has been kind of expanded and changed by the research and the learning that I've done in the last few years about him. Hmm, okay. So, um, by the way, how many folks out there when you were growing up in you know, elementary, middle, middle school had the same kind of... Um, Lincoln propaganda, yeah. as Steve Lincoln did. indoctrination, in, maybe. <laughs> yeah, because I remember in sixth grade, uh, in my in my schooling, we had we studied the Civil War, and one of our uh, tests was to memorize the Gettysburg Address, right? And stand, oh. stand. Don't go. ask me. Now. Go, come on. <laughs> it's only two hundred seventy-two words. <laughs> yes, but I'm about that many years older now than I was. Than I was. What if then. we try to do it together? I might miss something. You want to try? I can this like give you the risk. first words and the very go. last words. Go. That's it. Go. Well, four score and seven years ago, our, our forefathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Wow. <laughs> But then there's more. <laughs> now we're engaged in a great civil war that will test whether, and I'm probably getting a couple of words wrong, that will test whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Somebody whispered endure over there. Thank you. <laughs> if somebody else has the next line, that's great. We are met on a great battlefield of this war. Then there's something about we're here to dedicate a cemetery, but I, exact, I forget the I'm going to cheat. Oh. Because we have great producers. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field. Ah, thank you. As oh, final oh. resting place for for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot consecrate. We cannot dedicate this field. I think there's another word in there. Oh, go on. We cannot con I think a dedicated uh, we can de Dedicated here to the unfinished work that you fought for here have thus far so nobly advanced. Ah, nobly yes. advancing the uh, work. I, uh, yeah. We cannot consecrate. We cannot dedicate this field. The, why don't you read the next line? Okay. Gonna, it's so beautiful and I'm going to miss a word. Okay. Oh, you know what? I actually skipped it. You had it right. Stephen Skeep had it right. Let me fact check. Yes, but it, you, this is what you said and it was correct. We cannot, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, cannot consecrate, hallow this ground. We cannot hallow, hallow this, ground. this ground. But they've done this far beyond our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. Particularly because we said it so stumblingly. <laughs> <clears throat> but it can, can never, never forget, forget what they, they did here. here. Choked up. You finished. Oh, there's more up. now. Yeah, there's a little more. A little there's bit a little more. more. It is for us. Rather. It is for us, the living, rather, mm -hmm. to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. 
Do you have more? Finish it up. No, Finish is it? Do you no, have no. more? No, no, no. Okay. I, I, I don't want to get the end wrong about you know the power uh, of the earth. But yeah. go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Finish. Shall it. not perish from the earth. Shall not perish from the earth. Um, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead yes. we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Yes. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain that this nation under God shall have a new birth, birth of, of freedom. freedom and that the government of, of the, the people, people, by the people, people and for, for the, the people, people shall not, not perish, perish from, from the, the earth. earth. Yay. <clears throat> that, uh, who wrote that speech? A Abraham Lincoln really wrote that speech. He didn't write it on an envelope, which is one of the legends, but there are multiple drafts of the speech, uh, each of them slightly different. Um, it's a work of literature as well yes. as politics. It's a work of brilliant conception, and it is also only part of Lincoln's political skill. Uh, he was a great writer. Um, and a very modern writer uh, because of the efficiency that, of the way that he used language. But he was also someone who would fall silent, who would not tell people exactly what was on his mind, who would try to uh, persuade or occasionally manipulate people to do what he thought was necessary for them to do. There are a lot of skills involved in politics and involved in the practice of democracy that are often messier mm -hmm. than the amazing words of that address. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, one of the things that I discovered, I mean, it's well known, but I was not familiar with it, is a letter that he wrote to be read aloud to a crowd in almost the same season, a month or two before, that's about five times as long and way more frank about what's going on in the Civil War. It is about race, it's about power, it's about who belongs in the United States, it's about who should be fighting for the United States, and he is trying in that letter to persuade a crowd that ending slavery will be good for them, even though they are white men, many of whom are opposed to that action. Mm -hmm. So it's like the same theme as the Gettysburg Address, but dealing way more frankly with the issues. So picking up on that, um, is there anybody in the book, and if not, just continue on, on the, the path you were on. No, we're doing great. Where, he, where Lincoln was, you know, had a dialogue with someone who was dedicated to the preservation of the Union, but not the abolition of slavery. Oh. And how, and, and how did those, and what did he do particularly in those yeah, conversations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would start with uh, his best friend, Joshua Speed. Um, Differ We Must, the title of this book... Um, comes from a letter that Lincoln wrote to his best friend Joshua Speed in the years before the war. Joshua Speed had grown up in Kentucky, very privileged in a slaveholding family, on a farm worked by more than 50 enslaved laborers. And he, as an adult, said he disagreed with slavery in the abstract. But Lincoln said he was not serious about doing anything politically about it, and told him so, told his friend this in the letter. But then he said, but if for that you and I must differ, differ we must. Mm. And he continued working on this guy, kept him as a friend. In fact, he ends the letter with the phrase, your friend forever. And when the Civil War came and Lincoln was president, his friend Joshua Speed was on the Union side and helped to keep the slave state of Kentucky in the Union. Mm. Lincoln had many dealings with slave owners, slave holders, uh, and some of them he could not reach agreement with. There was a slaveholder named Duff Green who visited him shortly before his presidential inauguration and said, let's do a little compromise to get out of the, this, this war that seems to be looming. All you have to do is enshrine slavery in the Constitution forever and take a few other steps. Um, and Lincoln couldn't do it. His party couldn't do it. We're not, they were not going to go there. Um, and instead, Lincoln was inaugurated, and, and war came, and it was launched by the South. Um, yet all along the way, he is trying to keep people across the political spectrum on the right side 
or at least as many people as he can. And that ranges from more conservative people, to put it kindly, to uh, conservative politicians in the North who are only theoretically against slavery, to radical abolitionists who think that Lincoln is not nearly mm. radical enough. You know, um, it's easy to think from the perspective of 2023 that were we in the shoes of Lincoln, sizable shoes of Lincoln, yes. that uh, you know, in a similar conversation, if someone had come up and said, I will dedicate myself to helping you preserve the union, just enshrine slavery in the Constitution. That you know, of course, we'd say no. I mean, that, that, that's a morally uncompromising position, or you don't want to be morally compromised by no. allowing the very thing that's rending the the country to be enshrined in the Constitution. But uh, you know, maybe we wouldn't be that strong. What do you think it was about Lincoln in moments like that, where he's being confronted with people that he needs? Yeah. Uh, but they're making demands that he cannot compromise. Yeah, he seemed to have a keen long-term sense. He had a sense of what was important and what was not. It is said that he was this way in a courtroom. Uh, there are very few detailed records of the trials that he argued in a, as a lawyer, but it was said that as a lawyer, he would concede many points to the extent where the opposition might even think he was barely doing his job as a lawyer, mm -hmm. but he would hold on to the one fact that would decide the case. Um, and let everything else go and hold on to that one thing. And I think that he had that sense um, as a politician. When it comes to the issue that we're talking about, Lincoln was willing to discuss slavery in lots of different ways. He was willing to acknowledge that under the customs of the time and the Constitution as it was interpreted at the time, states that wanted to enslave human beings could just do it. It was legal, and those who didn't like it had very little that they could say about it. He was willing to accept that as a reality. But the one thing that he held on to was that slavery was wrong was an outrage, was an evil system. He was willing to be flexible with the people in that system, even the people who operated that system. But the wrongness of it was something that ultimately made him radical. When he became president, um, his party was insisting, we're not actually trying to interfere with slavery right. where it is. But the fact that he labeled it as wrong was something that those who supported the institution could not tolerate. So let's talk about that more, because um, abolitionists were the radicals of the time, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, aside from the people who wanted to preserve slavery, that was radical <laughs> on the right. <laughs> Depends but, on what you mean by radical. But in terms of radicals you might find yeah. um, in the Union. Uh, and I imagine that that Lincoln, I mean, there's some conversations or some people you have in the book with whom he had, you know, he had these dialogues, but also vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the Republican Party that yeah. he had to be a little cautious in terms of how closely he aligned himself. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of amazing. There, There is an early phase and there's a chapter in here with a, a guy named Owen Lovejoy, who was a radical anti-slavery figure. And uh, he invited Lincoln to join, in 1854, to join this new organization, this anti-slavery organization called the Republican Party. And rather than attend their opening convention, Lincoln left town to go argue a court case somewhere else. His friend, William Herndon, who was a kind of go-between, advised him to get as far away from these people as possible because they would damage him politically. They were considered extremists. Um, Lincoln ended up becoming friends with Owen Lovejoy and allies with Owen Lovejoy and joining the Republican Party. He did not change his fundamental beliefs about the best approach to slavery. In this case, they didn't disagree about slavery. They disagreed about the approach. And yet he found a way to ally with this much more radical uh, person whose brother had been killed by a pro-slavery mob for printing anti-slavery statements in his in his newspaper. Elijah Lovejoy was his name. Um, and I think this is really relevant to now because we talk about the partisan divide between red and blue, Republican and Democrat, conservative and liberal or progressive or whatever you want to say, but there are also gradations 
between the sides mm -hmm. and questions if you are a mainstream or moderate Democrat, can you really handle these woke progressive people or are they driving you batty? Are, and, and maybe the reverse is true. You know, if you are AOC, what are you going to do with Joe Manchin? And on the other side, I mean, uh, I mean, look at just what just happened in the House of Representatives. Um, I mean, you have uh, you have a, a mainstream Republican faction, I guess, or a, a whatever it is, and and a more radical faction, and large numbers of lawmakers that it's hard to see where they are, and none of them is in charge now. There is a basic fact about democracy that I think Lincoln understood, which is that you need to have a majority in order to get anything done. This is the reason that he reached out to wide ranging groups of people. You need a majority. And what has happened to the House Republicans, for the moment anyway, is that they seem to have lost sight of that. Kevin McCarthy, the former House Speaker, lost his majority. Uh, Matt Gates, who led the revolt against him, doesn't have a majority either. And they're in trouble because as a group, they had a very small majority, having not practiced a broad majoritarian kind of politics in the previous election, which they could have won by a lot more. We're going to come back to that. Okay. <laughs> um, but for Lincoln, in, in, in talking and having these dialogues with people of disparate intent, disparate, disparate values, yeah. um, what sort of language did he use to, to bridge the divide or to, to convert them into allies or at least not alienate oh, them as, you know, yeah. into let me, enemies? Yeah, let me uh, challenge one word in that question, convert. Okay. I don't know that Fair he necessarily enough. converted people. It was not like a religious, religious experience to talk to this guy, and that's not necessarily what he's even going for in these 16 meetings that I have chosen here. And I think there's another lesson for today in that. Um, if he's talking to uh, somebody who's had like a really strong belief about, about slavery or about any number of issues for 30 years, he didn't expect to suddenly change their mind with one speech or one letter or one face-to-face -face meeting. And so he had a, a more modest uh, but still very hard goal which is to figure out some way to deal with this person who had these differing beliefs. Um, and he would first essentially tolerate the reality that this person had a different belief, um, but then listen to him and also push and prod and try to use logic and explain why a slightly different approach would be in his interest or her interest. So appealing to the self-interest of the... Appealing to the self-interest of the other person, which requires thinking about that person, having some empathy, trying to understand where they're coming from and frame... <clears throat> frame the question in that way. And I think that is extremely relevant now because we're not going to go to, you know, Thanksgiving dinner and persuade our, you know, uncle to think differently about, about Donald Trump. Um, but maybe there is some narrower area of agreement that we can work out with this person. You know, what's so interesting about that is that it, the, the, the way you tell these stories, it also seems as if Lincoln very um, assiduously avoids value-laden language. Yeah. Right, which is the opposite of sort of how we deal with each other politically today, right? Because he yeah. doesn't use the words like freedom, liberty, all that much in these, you know, in, in these dialogues. Yeah, which is a surprise because we just read so badly the Gettysburg Address, <laughs> yeah. which is inspiring and appeals to our highest values. I guess maybe the way to put it is that he didn't personalize it. Hmm. There is a line in a speech from 1854 that shocked me a little bit when I first read it. And in recent days, I've been repeating it to people, and I think it's like shocked some people uh, as well. When he is talking to a white audience in Illinois, the free state of Illinois, so these are people who at least theoretically are against slavery, um, and he does not tell them that they are morally superior to slaveholders. He says the opposite. He says, if we were in their position, we might do as they do. And if they were in our position, they might do as we do. And that is a troubling thought in a way. But essentially he's saying human nature is what it is. People act on their own interests and self-interests. 
And that's often determined by something like where you're born, what system you're born into, uh, what is your situ- where you stand is where you're de- determined by where you sit, what is your job. Uh, any number of, of things can determine your view of the world and your view of your interests. And to Lincoln, the problem was not the terrible people on the other side. The problem was the system. Mm. And when you think that through, you realize he's not saying a squishy kind of morally ambiguous moderate thing. He's saying a radical thing, that we need to change the system and that we need a big change. And you're exactly right that today I think we sometimes approach really big issues in more of a personal improvement sort of way. I'm going to battle climate change by shrinking my carbon footprint just to give an example, and it's fine to shrink your carbon footprint, um, but we probably in this room all understand that that alone is not going to change you know, anything about, about climate change at this time. You need something bigger. You need changes in the system, systemic changes, and that's true of a lot of things when it comes to race, when it comes to the economy, economic equality. We could go through the... The, the list. And you just realize that he had bigger game on his mind. And I think that is a lesson for us as we consider our own politics and our own even personal relations. But to change a system, though, you need the cooperation of many, many people, yes. right? And so in those major ambitions, he had to, in a sense, it sounds like you're saying he had to... Um, reduce or pull his ego out of the forefront. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, And I think that's a challenge in the way our, um, you know, our our politics works today. Not for you, because you're very modest and, you know, very unassuming. (laughs) No. No, it is really hard. It is really hard. And we are encouraged uh, to kind of make it all about ourselves uh, and encouraged. And this is another way of saying what I just did. I mean, when you say you're superior to the other person, you're also encouraged to think of the other person as less than human. You're encouraged to demonize uh, that person as being hopeless, as being irredeemable, uh, as being you know terrible, as being a baby eater. I mean, there are things that people actually go around saying about each other today. Um, and Lincoln was just taking a very, very different approach. Yeah. Now, back when we were waiting um, in the green room before we came out here, you were telling a very interesting story about the sort of these sort of. Um, uh, tools, <laughs> rhetorical and um, and emotional tools that Lincoln had to deploy to even sort of get uh, get a hold of his own fractious and nascent Republican Party. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were talking about yeah. that. Um, oh, we we're talking about Congress. Is that what you're yeah. asking about? Yeah. I mean, so Lincoln uh, worked to help build the Republican Party before 1860. He then won the nomination for the presidency in 1860, and Republicans won. They united the voting power of the northern free states, which just had more population, and so they were able to win uh, the election. Um, This led southern states to say, we do not accept the results of a free and fair election. We're out of here. We're leaving, uh, and we're doing this to preserve slavery, and we're going to found a new republic on the principle of slavery which, by the way, is a thing that they literally said. I mean, people still argue today, like, what was the Civil War really about? And what did the South really want? And something about states' rights. You can respond to them. It was about slavery. And the reason we know is because they said so. In the Articles of Secession. Yeah. It's explicitly written there. I've, so, written, I've read about, you've probably read them all, but I've read about half a dozen of them, and it's clear. That's enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, they, they were explicit about what they were about. So they left, and their representatives left Congress. And this was very helpful to the new president of the United States because his party suddenly had huge majorities in Congress <laughs> because a large part of the opposition was just out of there. And so he had the advantage almost of one-party government, which immediately began to go wrong because the Republicans in Congress had almost too much power. 
and they began investigating the administration. They began looking for traitors in the administration because a war has begun. It's a civil war. You don't know if everybody's on the same side. And then something else happened that I think is a kind of salutary lesson for us today. When they were looking for traitors in the administration, they were especially susceptible to think that the traitor, because they're Republicans, especially susceptible to think the traitor was a Democrat. Um, and it became a partisan thing. Um, and it was rather dangerous. And so Lincoln at that point was having to uh, struggle with people in his own party to allow them to spa the space to do what they needed to do, but also continue reaching out to other people because he needed Democrats to help fight the war. He needed every kind of person that he could. The Civil War was, in a way, a kind of rerunning of the election. Mm. And the side that had the most people was going to win because they were going to have the bigger army and more money and more weapons. And Lincoln needed everybody on his side that he could get, including those who politically differed with him. Mm. I'd love it if you could tell us uh, the story of a couple of other people sure. in the book. William Florville. Absolutely. William Florville was Abraham Lincoln's barber. This is one of the people uh, of the 16 that I discovered I, I knew nothing about when I began this project. Some of them are famous, like William Henry Seward, uh, George McClellan. William Florville I'd never heard of, although, of course, Lincoln scholars know him well. He was uh, a Haitian immigrant. He came to the United States as a young man. He ended up in Springfield, Illinois, and effectively became an independent businessman who was friends with Abraham Lincoln. Their kids knew each other. Lincoln relied on his services for many years. Lincoln was a lawyer, and he would provide legal services to Florville. So they were friends, but they lived in entirely different legal worlds because Florville was black. And Illinois, while it was a free state, had what were known as black laws, uh, which restricted the rights of black people. They were not allowed to vote. They were not allowed to serve on juries. They were not allowed to testify in court. Uh, they had to file evidence that they weren't enslaved with the county clerk. After a while, more of them were even banned from coming to the state. It's rather horrifying, and it's a good reminder, I think, when we think about this giant divide, this divided society that we're considering, that the good guys were not necessarily all that good. I mean, from our perspective, the people who were better still were often doing terrible or unequal things. Um, and I found no evidence that Lincoln particularly spoke against the black laws. Mm. I think there were political reasons for that. He was focused on this larger target of slavery, and he had white voters he wanted to vote against slavery, and going against the black laws too would seem like too much. Some of his allies who tried to overturn the black laws were utterly defeated in the Illinois legislature, but it's a reminder of the complexity of that society and what was accepted as normal. Mm -hmm. I think, again, it's a kind of lesson for now because I wonder what things we do today that 100 years from now or 200 years from now people will look back on and be horrified that we did that and accepted it as perfectly normal. I wonder if Florville, though, is an example of whether in these dialogues, you know, Lincoln was attempting to um, appeal to the self-interest of those he differed with, but then did the reverse happen? Did these dialogues change oh, him? Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody was trying to get something out of him at the same time. Yeah. He was trying to get something out of everybody. I mean, Duff Green, this slave owner who came to him right before the war, wanted him to do this compromise. Mary Ellen Wise, um, another person that I can bring up here, is or was a woman who, by her own account, was born in Indiana, grew up... Uh, and at the onset of the war, cut off her hair, put on men's clothes, and enlisted in the United States Army. Several hundred women, it appears, did this, although it's hard to know the exact figure because they were disguising their identities and living under aliases. And in fact, um, some of the things that Mary Ellen Wise told about herself are definitely not true. They're just not logically possible. But she claimed to have gone into battle, to have been wounded, and she was actually discovered in uniform in war zones in the South. And in 1864, she went to the White House 
to say she was having trouble collecting her back pay. Mm. And Lincoln was sympathetic to her and wrote a note to take to the federal paymaster, effectively saying, pay this woman, and if it doesn't, if it turns out to be wrong for some reason, I'll cover the difference. I'll do it. Um, so she was trying to use him to get some money. And because her story is doubtful, it's not even clear that she was entitled, like what she was entitled to. Um, she got what she wanted out of him, but he got something also. Because there was a former congressman, a friend of Lincoln's, who had apparently brought her to the White House to see the president. And that former congressman, when it was over, this touching story of the president having sympathy for this young woman who fought for her country, he went to a newspaper and got a newspaper article published, and it was all over the place. Um, and Lincoln got a newspaper story about his sympathy for the common man, or in this case, the common woman. Um, there are many exchanges like that where, to get back to that word conversion, you don't find a conversion of belief, but you find a flexibility of thought, a practicality. In this case, Lincoln's desperate need was for manpower, for people to fight the war. He was willing to have somebody politically different fight the war, and he even promoted democratic generals to high positions of power. He was willing to have black men fight the war. That was a major reason, in fact, the official central reason for the Emancipation Proclamation was to get black laborers to be freed from the southern side and converted into soldiers on, on the northern side. And it turns out he was even willing to have a woman fight on the Union side because she was willing to stand up or said she was. Hmm. I'm thinking also about whether um, these people change some of Lincoln's thinking. Uh -huh. um, and specifically to take us back to, to Florville, yes. I think it's important to know that you said he's from Haiti. Oh, thank you. Right? Yes. Because um, wasn't one of Lincoln's earliest acts when he became president to reopen um, yeah. relations with, with Haiti? Yes. As a matter of fact, we cannot prove that there's a connection between those two things. But you're exactly right. He had this long relationship with a Haitian immigrant, and the United States had never recognized Haiti as an independent country. Mm. For those who do not know, it was a black republic, an overwhelmingly black republic, uh, the first such country uh, that, that existed in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, there goes a pen. That's it's very right. sad. It can uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, I believe 13 straight U.S. presidents had refused to recognize the independence of Haiti because it was just too scary to have black people who had revolted against their white masters right. and won their independence. Yeah. And one of the earliest signs of his administration that Lincoln was going to be open to and determined to enact a different way of looking at the world, a more equal way of looking at the world, was that, in fact, he called for the United States to reopen diplomatic relations with Haiti. And the Congress that he had on his side passed a bill to do that, and they sent the first, uh, the first diplomat to Haiti in 1862. Hmm. Well, I want to um, take a second to link your previous book that we talked about That's just fine. three years ago to this one, because sure. the two people, the two key people from your previous book, I want to just be sure, uh, Jesse and John Fremont. Yes. They appear in the new book. They do. Can you tell me why? Um, repetition. <laughs> um, because Jesse Benton Fremont is one of the most fascinating women of the period, uh, I had written this book about their earlier lives, Jesse and John. John Charles Fremont was a famous Western explorer and war hero uh, and self-promoter. And Jesse Benton Fremont was his uh, wife, who was kind of the brains of that operation and his publicist and also a self-promoter. And uh, they were very, very famous. And John had, in fact, been the first Republican nominee for president in 1856. And I had an opportunity in this book to continue a little bit of the story. John, in the Civil War, accepted a general's command uh, in charge of the American West with his headquarters in St. Louis. Um, and Missouri was a slave state that remained loyal to the Union, but there were battles there and many questions about people's loyalty. Amazingly, even the governor went over to the other side and declared himself a Confederate governor of a Confederate state, uh, and the legislature voted to depose him because it was a pro-Union legislature. John C. Fremont, as a general, was having trouble getting his hands around this situation, and as a drastic move, 
issued a kind of emancipation proclamation. In 1861, freeing the enslaved laborers of slaves, of, of, of rebels, forgive me, freeing the slaves of rebels. And uh, Lincoln was not ready to do this as president of the United States. His Emancipation Proclamation was still more than a year in the future. And he was deeply worried about keeping a slave state like Missouri in the Union, keeping a slave state like Kentucky in the Union, and Maryland as well. Um, and he feared that if they broke away from the Union cause, that they would lose the war. And so he was not ready to go around freeing slaves. Um, he sent... Fremont a letter asking him to modify his emancipation, <laughs> and Fremont, being a stubborn guy, didn't do it, decided that it was an insult, that he would be told to change his order, um, and so he declined, wrote a letter to Lincoln saying why he declined, and then sent his wife, Jessie, to Washington to argue it out with the President of the United States. <laughs> um, which is just truly an awesome story. In 1861, um, for a woman to have that confidence and to give herself a central role in a place where she was not supposed to be. She was a special person for that role because she was the daughter of a senator and she had been to the White House many times and she had known multiple presidents. Uh, and so she got off the train in Washington, D.C., having come from St. Louis mm. and went to the White House and was uh, guided into one of the ceremonial rooms. And the president of the United States appeared at least a foot taller than her, if not more. Um, and uh, she hands over uh, her husband's letter and they had a discussion about it. And Lincoln was not in a mind to be changing his viewpoints. He says, General Fremont knows what I want done. And he really didn't want to discuss it any further with, with Jesse. Um, and in Lincoln's account of the meeting, he was struggling through the meeting to not lose his temper, <sighs> to be polite. <clears throat> in Jesse's account of the meeting, he was in fact rather brusque and, uh, and rude. Um, and... Uh, finally, uh, Jesse says, so what answer can I take back to General Fremont? And he says, I'll send him a letter. Um, she goes away with nothing. She had come to the White House with a, a politically well-informed kind of escort, a man who knew things, and the man had watched Lincoln's response to this whole exchange. And uh, as they leave the White House, uh, her, her advisor escort turns to her and says, your husband is finished which in fact turned out to be the case. He was fired as a general some uh, weeks later uh, amid various other scandals and, and problems. I think that you see a lot of Lincoln's sort of political intelligence here. He had a sense of timing having to do with slavery. He was not ready to do it. He had a sense of authority. This was a political decision, not a military decision, what to do with slavery. And he said, this, this decision belongs to me and not this general over here. And he was also very well aware that Fremont, in various other ways, had annoyed politically influential people in Missouri and therefore was undermining his own ability to do the job. Um, we can look at that as a simple moral question where General Fremont and his wife were on the right side for freedom and Lincoln was on the wrong side of hold on, hold on, hold on. That's one way to look at this. But another way to look at it is with all those layers that Lincoln considered, right. where he had to think about the overall strategy and also who had a right to make the decision about that strategy. Okay, so that is... Um a very compelling way to connect Lincoln to now. Because, you know, Lincoln and the country was facing the truly existential catastrophe of the Civil War, yeah. right? And, and the possibility of the United States of America. Well, it, it officially actually did cease to exist when the South seceded. Um, Not according to the... Union. Not according to the Union. They but said you can never actually succeed. It wasn't peacefully resolved. True, true, um, true. But I guess what I'm saying is there's there's obvious, obvious um, incentives for Lincoln to adopt the, as you call it, like morally backed but pragmatic approach 
um, when dealing with people of differing views. I wonder if the same incentives exist today. Um, I kind of think not, but do you think Lincoln's approach would work today? I think that we can learn from Lincoln's approach. I do think the incentives are pretty bad. I'm glad you brought up that word. I think that we have a lot of incentives to lash out at people, a lot of incentives to be angry and offended, a lot of incentives to think about the immediate and the short term. Um, uh, social media is something where all of those things are true simultaneously. Constantly another thing is demanding our attention. Um, Twitter, when it functioned, uh, and I guess it still sort of does as X, was this giant tool that seemed perfectly designed, like whoever you were, whatever your views were in the world, at some point in the day, you would be delivered the single most offensive thing to you that anybody said today. Um, and you could get angry about it and immediately uh, respond. And that, in microcosm, is the set of incentives we have right, right now. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to lash out. I want everything to change right now. I mean, the chaos in the House of Representatives is a symptom of that. You know, my own party leader is not doing everything I demand. I must lash out. And uh, by the way, if you're a Republican lawmaker and you don't lash out, someone is going to lash out at you for failing to lash out. Mm -hmm. You're a sellout. You're a rhino. You're going to be told that by talk radio. You're going to be told that on social media. Um, and the parties are not the same. The Democratic Party has different dynamics and different issues, but there is something like that on the Democratic side as well, where people will uh, lash out if you're not doing just what they want right now. The incentives are bad, and yet I think some of the principles still can be applied. And there are people who attempt to think long-term and who attempt to think in terms of coalitions and alliances and compromise. There has been some of that even during this administration. I was driving earlier this year through Pennsylvania. Uh, I believe it was to take my 18-year-old to college, which I was very happy to do. And we got into some road construction and we're like stuck, like stopped on an exit ramp that's got the new black pavement and a bunch of traffic cones around and so forth. And I looked off to my left because we were stopped and uh, there was a blue and white sign that said paid for by the Bipartisan Infrastructure <laughs> Act, <laughs> which is something that had been uh, favored by Republicans and signed by the President of the United States, who is a Democrat, I was particularly interested that they didn't say, like, you know, it didn't say Biden, you know, it didn't say Joe, it said Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. The act itself was uh, something that is far-seeing, it's investing in the long term, it is something that was done through a coalition of politically profoundly different people, and it was actually a, a rather clever touch that someone said bipartisan, rather than uh, the president's name uh, or whatever else might have been on the sign. That is a small example, but not a meaningless one. Um, I think of the Inflation Reduction Act, where there was tremendous angst among Democrats. Republicans weren't even really part of this process. Among Democrats about how big this bill should be and what it should be called and what its purpose should be. Um, at, but in the end, a conservative senator from West Virginia who was despised by progressives signed on to a fairly large piece of legislation with things like subsidies for changing the economy to encourage uh, climate investment. There are also fossil fuel energy subsidies in there. If you're a progressive, you won't like everything in that bill. But the point is that there are examples that we can point to where people with really different views of the world who tend to get really angry at each other also have been able to think about the long term mm. and get something done. That was coalition building within one party, though. Yes, yes. And the other half of the story is the complete rejection by the other party. The complete rejection by the other party, and it is some, in some ways it's hard to know what to do with that. Um, what happened over the last several days uh, was that Congress passed a short-term funding bill, which is a thing that they've done again and again and again for generations if they haven't met their work deadline they extend the deadline a little bit and keep on working on it. Um, and that was unacceptable 
to a minority of people, which because of the incentives, because of the particular dynamics of this moment, a very small number of people were able to overcome the evident desires of the majority. Um, and I just based saying the majority on the vote, the overwhelming vote for extending the, uh, extending the appropriations for another, another uh, 45 days, I believe. Um, and I do not pretend that we can all act like Lincoln and cause the other people to agree. Lincoln's own story includes a civil, a civil war. war. <laughs> yeah. um, so you can't get everyone to agree all the time. But if we want to move in the right direction and have a democracy, both of which I would suggest are necessary, we, need, we don't need to get everyone to agree on what the right direction is, but we need a majority. Yeah. And we need a majority who are, aside from any particular policy, fundamentally in favor of the system of this republic. Okay, so we, technically we only have three minutes, but I have several questions which might take us a we, little tiny bit beyond that. Do a that. lightning round. Is that, because, yes, no questions. Because it's, we don't just have, you know, Steve Inskeep, historian and author on stage with us. We have NPR's Steve Inskeep, whom I consider to be one of the closest things that we have to a Walter Cronkite of our generation. Um, and uh, Thank you. And so I do actually want to ask you, and again, forgive me, if you have to leave, I completely understand, but a couple of questions about um, journalism and our democracy sure. right now. How, We're what, doomed. No, what, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go on. What is your approach to covering Donald Trump's re-election campaign? Um, I want to cover it factually, straightforwardly, and specifically. Now, I choose that last word for a reason. There is this whole debate in media, which uh, I get a little annoyed by, but are we going to be objective, uh, stenographer? Are we going to speak truth to power? Um, none of them quite captures what I feel is necessary for me to do as a journalist. I think people do get frustrated, rightly so, with he, sh he said, she said journalism. Um, you know, Donald Trump says the election was stolen. Other people say otherwise. That is not the right way to cover a story. Um, uh, but if I just get up there and say, Donald Trump is evil, other people are good, I'm not sure that I'm really doing anything, you know. But you don't have to but, say that, though, because... No, I don't. No, I... I mean, we've had lots of discussions with people who've spent their careers studying the rise and fall of various democracies throughout history. Yeah. And... Those folks are fairly unified in their concern that if Donald Trump gets reelected, he's made his plan clear. His plan is to essentially turn the executive branch of the United States into an authoritarian branch of government. Um, and uh, so they are very concerned about the current fragility and future you know, li uh, viability of our yeah. democracy. What is the role of the media in, in an election like this one which is unlike any that we've had let before. Me, let me get back to that word specificity. Okay. I think that is an answer. Specifically, what you're talking about, I think, is uh, former President Trump's plan to reshape the federal bureaucracy so that it's much easier for him to fire people currently classified as civil servants so that he can just be, he can get more of his orders followed immediately rather than his, the perceived resistance of the civil service to his various demands, whether they're legal or sensible or not. Um, we have covered that. We've covered it in detail. We did an in-depth story on that. We will surely do more. Um, and I think that our reporting makes clear what's going on there and what is at stake. It is not my job to say uh, that is a great idea or a terrible idea. It is my job to be really exact about what it is and what it means. Um, and I think that is true on issue after issue after issue. I've been thinking about the challenge of covering an indicted president who is supposed to be on trial if the schedules hold in like, he's got a trial in March, he's got another trial in March, he's got a trial in May, he's got a trial they haven't even scheduled yet. It's unbelievable. Um, and there's a particular problem here because he is being accused in a couple of the trials of crimes related to his effort to overturn the 2020 election that he lost. In America and in the criminal justice system, you are innocent until proven guilty. And so someone is alleged to have committed a crime. I am happy to say in news copy that the president, the former president, is 
alleged to have committed a crime, but I'm not going to pretend that I don't already know that he tried to overturn the election that he lost. That is something we have covered. That is something that we've reported out. That is something that has been affirmed by dozens of courts and thousands of election officials in both parties. And so we want to be absolutely clear there is a distinction there. We will let the courts do their process to see if they determine that this or that criminal law was violated, but we will not back off from stating the facts that we already know and that we witnessed and that we reported about what happened in 2020 and what he tried to do about his defeat. Mm. And I think that can apply on issue after issue after issue. I would say that we may be in a time where specificity, absolutely, but it also constantly requires context. So, because I we face this every day too. Like, you know, we've talked about X, and then we talk about something else which is related to it. Yeah. But do we have time to reiterate the context? Fortunately, I mean, I do. The, the, I'm on a show that's 48 minutes long. It's a very different story with the art that is morning edition. Um, but because of that truth, I what I perceive to be a truth, I want to just ask you um, about something I heard on NPR just yesterday. Sure. Uh, I'm not. It doesn't matter who the reporter was. It's just it's the, it's NPR as a as an overall institution. Sure. Okay, so it was in the newscast, so it's just like a little 40-second thing, okay? And I'm just going to read what the news, the little okay. newscast item was. It was live from MTR News, blah, blah, blah. And then it said, former President Donald Trump is calling on the Republican National Committee to cancel the next Republican debate. NPR's so-and-so says, Trump wants the party to unite its resources and manpower behind his campaign. And then the reporter comes in and does this spot. The Trump campaign says the RNC should end all future debates. Senior advisor Susie Wiles and Chris Lasovida said in a statement that anything less would be an admission to grassroots voters that their concerns about voter integrity are not being taken seriously and that the national Republicans are more concerned helping President Biden than ensuring a safe and secure election. The RNC plans to hold its third debate in Miami on November 8th. Trump has skipped every debate so far. There have been two. The former president leads his rivals by double digits in repeated polls, and he cites that as a reason for skipping the debates, arguing that he shouldn't have to waste his time with rivals who are so far behind him. Blah, 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 NPR News. I have a problem with that spot. Go on. It is a complete repetition of a statement from a, from a campaign whose candidate is openly authoritarian. There is no context given here. There isn't even a single statement saying, it's not normal for a candidate to say his entire party should lay down any support for any other candidate and align behind him, and that they should no longer even support debates between candidates. It's just stating like, Trump said this, the RNC is gonna have a third debate, Oh, and by the way, Trump is ahead by double digits, so that's his reason for saying he shouldn't stand up before the American people and justify his second run for the White House. This, and I am a, you know, a member station colleague of yours and NPR, so my respect for all that we do is, is I, it's, I have a devoted respect, but I am concerned when this is the kind of stuff that we also do. And I say we, because I think about my show every day too. That, this is not enough for me. And I don't think this is enough for what journalism needs to be for the American people today. I would agree with you when you read that. Uh, I'm not happy hearing what you described there. And it is less a matter of what is there than what is absent. I'm perfectly happy to hear someone's statement about why they say they're doing something, but there is layer upon layer upon layer. The reference to election integrity and election security uh, is uh, not terribly veiled reference back to conspiracy theories about how Trump won in 2020, which he lost. Um, and one would need to add that context, I believe. One would need to add the basic political context that it's kind of common for people to want to duck debates when they think they're way ahead and there's nothing in it for them. But there's also an argument for having an argument. Um, uh, you'd be interested in what the other candidates even have to say. Um, you'd be interested in what the Democrats have to say. Or even aside from other people's statements, you want more context. Um, I would defend our network to the extent that I could choose a different story. Yeah. And... Uh, 
I think that what we have attempted to do with our stories on Morning Edition, which are not 48 minutes long, but can be three or five or seven or 11, um, is add lots of context. If we interview one newsmaker, as they're called, um, I find it important to add something to that one voice. I mean, journalists are told not to rely on a single source for a story. Lots of stories that you see are a single source. Somebody put out a press release and it kind of gets barely rewritten and, and, and published. Um, an interview can be a single source story. Let me tell you how I see the world. And there's value in an interview to see how somebody uh, views the world, but you want to be sure that you are asking questions that add context and probe and challenge. You want to be sure that you add other voices when you put that story on the air. You want to play tape of other people. You want to hear archival uh, archival sounds. You want to have facts in the writing around the interview. And that, I would suggest, uh, I'm not here just to defend what we do, but I would suggest that we do a lot of that and that we do a lot of that a lot better than a few years ago. And even that that NPR does it a lot better than a lot of networks. Yes. Uh, I would concede that you can can grab that news item and read what you read, and it's hard to, to work around it. Yeah. So, I mean, to be fair, this is a spot, right? It's 40 seconds long. But you... It's really stood out to me because of what you what you said about selection. Every minute of the day, people are, people are relying on NPR and stations like WBUR. Um, and I do believe, I'll just speak for myself, that, that we have a greater responsibility than ever to be very scrupulous about what we put on the air every minute yes. of the day. Yes. Um, and so I, I know I have to wrap up, so I'm just going to try to turn it back to Lincoln because That's of course okay. he had You're to be scrupulous. Fine. Well, he had to also be scrupulous for in, in how he managed his he, relationships. He complained about newscasts also. I'm sure, and he complained about the press oh, <laughs> more broadly, bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. He had so, his views. So overall, um, again, I have like 50 more questions about the media, but I will not ans- ask them right now. Um, I'm just wondering, there, there have been quite a few questions about uh, whether or not you see any lawmaker or politician now being somewhat yeah. Lincoln. I will. Yeah. And I can, I can do a lightning round and do two or three questions if you want. I'm not going to say anybody is like Abraham Lincoln today, but I think there are people who attempt this kind of politics. I think Biden has fairly openly attempted this kind of politics where he says it's about dealing with people you disagree with and building coalitions and compromising uh, with the other side. I think that he worked as a vice president for a president who very openly tried to model Lincoln in some of his decisions. And if you look at Barack Obama's approach to gay marriage, it was rather similar to Lincoln's approach to slavery. I'm not going to do anything about it until suddenly I'm going to do something about it. Go get some more questions. No, we're going to stop there. Oh, I think. okay. Because <laughs> we're 10 minutes over. All right, but, that's fine. But Steve, you're always so gentlemanly and gracious. And thank your you. books are tremendous. I can't thank you enough for, for coming back to WBUR. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you for a fascinating conversation. You can buy Steve's book out in the lobby. He will be signing. And if you want to see what's coming up at City Space, go to sign up for our newsletter. The QR code is right here. And I think this crowd may be interested in a live podcast of Left, Right, and Center that's going to take place here on October 26th with a former Morning Edition host, David Green. Oh, what do you know? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys.